Well, good evening, brethren. Good to be with you again. And please, would you be able to turn with me to Daniel chapter 8, if you have your Bible with you. Daniel chapter 8. And I'll actually read the second half of the chapter from verse 15. And before we do so, let's just pray again. Lord, we thank you that your word is settled forever in the heavens. And we thank you that you're a God who has spoken and revealed your ways and spoken to us and chiefly shown us your son that by faith in him, we might have everlasting life. And we realize, therefore, there's nothing more important than that which we hear from your word this evening. And we pray that for you would settle our hearts, open our eyes and speak to us. And would you yourself expand the scriptures by your spirit? And we thank you for our time together. Amen. So Daniel chapter eight and uh, reading from verse 15. And it came to pass when even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall the vision shall be the vision. Now, as you're speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed shall the end be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his own power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause to cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many he shall stand also up against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without hand and the vision and of the evening and the morning which is told is true wherefore shut thou up the vision for it shall be for many days and I Daniel fainted and was sick Certain day afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, vision but none understood it. Well, I, I trust that you've um, enjoyed this chance to look through the book of Daniel, and I, I trust also that you've seen, though, some of these things that at first reading might appear complicated and might think, I can't possibly read the book of Daniel, that you've seen that if we take it steadily and compare scriptures to scripture, uh, and ask the Lord, as Daniel did, for insight into these things. We find very practical uh, and wonderful things. It's like looking for treasure, isn't it? Searching into the Word of God, that you you find a seam, and uh, and then you dig, and there's more treasure, and you ex and you find more and more wonderful things in His Word. And others have wisely said as well that if at times you go to a passage and the Lord doesn't open to you something specifically, then don't be don't be worried by that. Don't be concerned by that. It might be that now the Lord does not wish you to know these things, but he might in due course and, and, and move on and keep going through the scriptures as in them there is life and truth. And well, Daniel chapter eight is no exception to this. And forgive me for not having time to read the chapter, but there are some thrilling things in here that show just how wonderful our God is. And isn't that one of the very simple applications that we can take from scripture that we might be able to see truly our God is wonderful. It's one of the great names that is given to Christ, isn't it? His name shall be called wonderful. And we see some thrilling shadows of Christ in this scripture. But at the same time, as building on chapter seven, we also see some of the shadows uh, in this particular little horn that I will speak, Lord willing, a little bit later on, of the Antichrist who will also come. But we find the 
above all, the great sovereignty of God that exists here. And I trust to take you slowly through a few things tonight that just show the majesty of our God and Father. Now, uh, sometimes it's easy to read over details of scripture and think that they are there by accident. But back in the start of the chapter, we find where this vision, this revelation was given to Daniel took place. And indeed, the time of it, he says in verse one, in the third year of King Baj Bel Shazer, and he says, I saw in a vision and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, it's very easy to gloss over these things and think oh, others know significance in these. But if I just help you by geography, just a little bit of this, he says that at this time it was a province of, of Babylon. But I think the Lord leads us these things to say, well, why why did the Lord choose to give Daniel a vision of himself by being a river at the palace of Shushan? Well, I suggest to you, if you look at the scriptures and compare them, the, the reason why this is, is that Shushan, the palace, would be the setting for the book of Esther and the book of Nehemiah. In other words, these were the kingly palaces of the Medo-Persian Empire, who were shortly to come to pass. You see, Belshazzar, who we're reading about here in his third year, it's thought that this was actually the last year of his reign before the events, if you can understand my meaning, that took place with his writing on the wall in chapter five took place. This was the very end of the kingdom of Babylon. And what was to follow was to be the Medo-Persian Empire. And you might say, well, I'm not a particularly interested in ancient history. Why should I be interested in this? Well, the significance, of course, of the Medo-Persian Empire, and um, we know for a fact that this is then depicted through this chapter as a ram with its two horns, the second of which horn is greater than the other, which talks about the Medo-Persian Empire, where in fact, a told this. When uh, Gabriel expounds it, uh, he says very plainly to Daniel in verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And Shushan was one of the royal palaces of the Medo-Persian empire. And what Christ, what God is showing Daniel, it is what is shortly to come to pass, that is shortly, the Medo-Persian Empire are going to defeat the Babylonians and take the kingdom. But thrillingly, of course, if you look what happens in Esther, then it was Cyrus, the Persian, who first gave the commandment for the end of the Jewish end exile. Their time of captivity would come to an end under the Medo-Persian Empire. Under Darius, it was then that the command to to rebuild the temple is given. This was shortly to come to pass. There was, there was an end. And, and if I might make one first application to us tonight, you see, at the time with his natural eye, Daniel would have thought, well, the Babylonian empire will continue forever. Were it not that God had told him already that it would not, it would have seemed so permanent and sure. But in fact, God was about to do something very soon that would bring about the end of the captivity of the Jewish people and fulfill it. And it's very important for us to realize this because we, we stand by faith, don't we? And faith isn't blind faith, something that happens naturally to us, that I have faith and you don't. But it's, it's believing, hearing what God has said and believing it to be true. Maybe sometime in spite of everything that we see. And there are many things that we hold by faith, don't we, rather than by sight. The promises that God has given us. None of us have ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ, but we know in our hearts that he is Lord of Lords and, and King of Kings because we've read the scriptures. We know that he is coming uh, and we know that he has promised us his wealth untold, that we will not taste of death because we've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day we will see a new kingdom. And we might say sometimes in our darker moments, well, 
maybe it's not true that there could be another kingdom, that there could be a kingdom of heaven where one day I will be and walk in a new body, having been transformed. And we might think, maybe that's just not true. Maybe I'm optimistic and self-deceived. But no, the Lord is the same God who brought about the end of the Babylonians, who brought about the Medo-Persians, and who will bring about the new heavens and the new earth. It is absolutely certain because God has spoken and God has sworn. Now, thank God we don't have to be left in darkness as to the meaning of the vision that Daniel had. He had a vision, first of all, of a ram with two horns, which is on the east of this river that I described in, in chapter 8 and verse 1. And I said in verse 20, the, Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel is told to tell Daniel the meaning and says that the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. So this ram, uh, the horns depicted the two kings. And that's a, a principle which we can apply to the book of Revelation and elsewhere in Daniel, that the horns depict a king or a kingdom. And it has two because it was a Medo-Persian empire. But then really the focus of this chapter that comes about is this rough goat. And again, we don't have to try and divert, divulge from history and our history books and reading writers such as Josephus, the uh, secular Jewish historian, to find out about who this is, because the angel Gabriel tells us, and he says in verse 21, the rough goat is a king of Grecia, the king of Greek, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, you... Uh, Although his name is not given here, when you look at history, there can be absolutely no doubt that this was the first great Greek king, who was King Alexander. And uh, in fact, Alexander, it, it said that when he came to Jerusalem, as his kingdom reached there, that he actually got off his horse or whatever it was he was riding and walked forward to meet the high priest outside the gates of Jerusalem. And the high priest uh, had told people to open the gates that this king could come in. And the reason was that they knew from prophecy that the king of Greek of Greece would come up there. And Alexander himself, uh, Josephus records this, and this isn't in scripture, but I think it's interesting, had a dream where he saw someone clothed like a high priest meeting him outside the gates of Jerusalem. And the Lord sometimes works that way, doesn't he? It doesn't mean that God is commending Alexander as a righteous and a godly king. There's evidence that he was far from that. But yet, rather like he says to Cyrus, my servant, so Alexander was to be his servant. And he was great. We know him to this day, don't we? Certainly in Britain as Alexander the Great. But where did his greatness come from? Well, we find, if you look uh, down at Daniel chapter 8, this very interesting thing that it says in verse 16 i heard a man's voice between the banks of ulai now just pause there isn't that an interesting saying that daniel has had this vision of this of this ram and this goat and a violent confrontation between them and seen the horns and these noticeable horns and uh, and yet on the river he now when it comes to the interpretation the revelation that's given to him to explain it he hears a voice between the banks. In other words, a voice moving upon the waters, over the waters. And, and of course, doesn't this, uh, and some would say, what does that mean? Who is this voice? Well, perhaps I could take you back to the book of Genesis and the creation. And do you remember how it all began and how God speaks? He says that the, the spirit of God moved upon the waters and then God spoke by Christ and it came to being so whose voice was this who was moving over the waters by whom was it was this the word of God is this Christ himself speaking because look and I agree with those who have said this what does the voice say which called and said Gabriel make this man to understand the vision now uh, who is it that can summon and command angels. 
whose will is it that angels instantly and perfectly fulfill? Is it not none other than the voice of God? That, and who is the word of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder if this isn't one of these shadows, these types of Christ or even Christ himself and his voice, that he is there on the river. He is the one who is determining when the Medo and Persian will come forth, when the Greek empire will come forth. It, it is true, isn't it, that the Lord Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There isn't a, a chaotic period of history, but Christ was the Lord over all these. And, and, and if I might also say this thrilling thing, we're not told many angels' names in the Bibles, are we? Uh, we're told, I think, by uh, twice, two names of angels, Michael, later in this book, uh, and Gabriel, who also appears later in, in this book. But otherwise, their names are secrets. And in fact, when some, as you know, in the Old Testament, have an angel appear, there's one instance where they say, tell us your name. And they say it, it is forbidden. It is secret. You are not permitted to know. But God has told us the name of this Gabriel because Christ calls out and says, Gabriel, go and do this because he wants us to know who this angel is. And isn't this intriguing? It's thrilling, isn't it, to know this? And again, we might say, well, why is it that God would have us to know who this angel is? Well, isn't he the same angel who stands in the presence of the God of all the earth, who, who appears in the New Testament also to the parents of John the Baptist when Zechariah says, well, how can it be that my wife will have a son, Elizabeth, when she's an old lady and I am an old man? And what's the answer that Gabriel gives? I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and I'm sent to speak up to thee. Don't think who you are, Zechariah. I am Gabriel. And that and Gabriel means man of God. He stands in the presence of the God of all the earth. This is the holy angel. And he also appears, doesn't he? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee to Mary to tell her uh, that by the spirit of God, she would be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And who was it that God sent to do these things? It was Gabriel. Who is it that God now sends to explain to Daniel the vision that he's given? It is Gabriel sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Gabriel, the angel sent forth. And, and how thrilling, because it must have seemed that all was lost. You know, the psalmist in Psalm 137 writes that by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. That's Psalm 137. That it was a time of grief, wasn't it? They were destroyed. They were ruined. The temple was gone. The presence of God had gone. And it seemed that the purposes of God had gone, had been thwarted. Far from it. Far from it. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for the time of the end shall be the vision. What an incredible vision that he was to have revealed by the mouth of God. But I'd like to skip over the media and Persian empire for time's sake. And focus in on this curious thing that shall happen. That is a rough goat. And in verse 22, now being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And the Lord has described how Alexander would be this great horn, but suddenly would be broken. And if you read the history books, it's very tragic that Alexander the Great, tragic in that the, the death of any sinner is tragic, isn't it? was only 36 years old, historians reckon, when he died. And he died very suddenly. Some have even wondered whether he was poisoned by the suddenness of his death. But the point was he had no heirs appointed. And consequently, four of his prominent deputies stepped up. And there was a, the Greek Empire, in effect, had four 
different leaders over it. As he describes it, exactly as how God has said, the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now being broken, four stood up for it. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And this is really one of the focuses of the chapter. This little horn, which it describes earlier as a little horn, one of these four will start little, but will ex- it will grow, but it will be distinguished by the wickedness of his works. He says in verse 24 that he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and shall practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And when Daniel hears this explanation, we find at the end of the chapter that he was fainted and he was sick for several days afterwards. And and I'm sure it was the revelation about what this wicked one of these four descendants of Alexander would do and how he would devilishly prosper, exalt himself to heaven. He says he shall magnify himself in his heart in verse 27 and shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. What an astonishing character this is. And all of the various writers are absolutely apparent that this was one of the Hellenistic Syrian kings called Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, Epiphanes was actually a title that Antiochus gave to himself, and uh, you wouldn't believe what it means. It means God manifest. And he exalted himself spiritually in a way that was absolutely unique. And exactly as written in Daniel chapter 8, this wicked king, who was one of these four descendants of, of Alexander, did one particular deed, which was to defile the temple of God. As I mentioned, I think briefly last week, he set up in the temple of God in Jerusalem an altar to Zeus. And he also within there set up an image of his own self, telling people that he should be worshipped. And do you notice the name he gave himself? Epiphanes. God manifested. Now, who is it? Who else is permitted to take the name of Christ, which is Emmanuel, God with us? But he took this title to himself. He defiled the temple with pig's blood. And what wickedness he did. And he came in peacefully, but he turned out to be an absolutely wicked foe and against God. This is around 175 to 164 years before Christ. And I don't have time to go into the time frame that's contained earlier in chapter, which says that he'll continue for 2,600 years at this this abomination will go on. But that that relates, sorry, 2,300 days, not years, which, of course, correlates to the amount of time that Antiochus Epiphanes was in power. But he, he did these abominable spiritual things. He, he waved his fist to God and defied the Most High. And consequently, he shall be broken without hand. That is, it will not be man who will bring him down, but it will be God. And this here is one of the types, isn't it, of the Antichrist. You see, some say have said that, that Antiochus Epiphanes, therefore, was the Antichrist, and he fulfilled all of the scriptures about this, and therefore we don't look for another. Another view, which I would agree, is that he was one of the types of the Antichrist, but but the Antichrist will come in the future in the same manner, and how grievous he will persecute and pursue and attack the Most High God. But God reminds us in this chapter that it is Christ who is king over all the earth. It is he who controls, who brings up and brings down. And though 
many wicked will rise up. Even the Antichrist himself who will defy God, who will attack his people, who will seek to destroy his spiritual temple. These, yet Christ is on the throne and his will will be done. See, this is how mighty our God is. I don't want us to look at these things and be impressed by the Medo-Persian or the Greek or the strength of the Antichrist. Rather, this is God by his words speaking these things. Remember, Daniel has these revelations when he is still under the Babylonian Empire, where outwardly there was no sign that anything would be changed. But God tells him exactly what is going to happen through to the coming of this deeply wicked individual, including, can we say this, the restoration of the temple. All is revealed to God, to Daniel, by the word of God. And can I just very briefly, and I'd like to draw to a close, and as I said before, if you were to write down my sermons over the last few periods of time and, and try to make them to a commentary on Daniel, there would be big gaps, and I'm not trying to do a Bible study in these things, but to pick out some of the main applications to us and and trust that you would be encouraged to read them for yourselves. And indeed, you might come to some different conclusions about some of the interpretation of the prophecy, which, which is fine. But in Daniel chapter, sorry, Psalm and chapter 29, there are these great verses, which I think is very apt. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty. Give unto the Lord's glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And this was the voice that said, Gabriel, go tell Daniel what these things mean. The Lord Jesus Christ, how full of majesty and might and glory he is. And may we indeed fall at his feet and give the glory unto him. And yet the psalm also says this by way of second application, because you might read Daniel and think, gosh, Daniel really is quite a weak man. He, in many respects, he, he did nothing, didn't he? He, he? he saw, it was explained, he fell on his face and you think, where's his greatness, Daniel? Where is your greatness? Is it not by the strength of your arm that you will conquer? But no, it was in Daniel's weakness. It it, he fell to his face before God and before this angel. And in a deep sleep, he couldn't even move before the majesty of just this one angel, albeit Gabriel. Yet the Lord touched him and gave him strength. And Psalm 29 finishes, the Lord sitteth upon the floods. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And though there was much trouble depicted and described and foretold in Daniel chapter 8, we have these two promises that, brethren, we too must hold on to. The Lord will give strength to his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. We must hold on to those, mustn't we? Because though he might lead us through great waters and maybe ways sometimes we would choose not ourselves to go, we can hold on to that. He will give me strength and he will give me peace, just as he did with Daniel. And my final application is this. Do you see the great contrast between Daniel and this wicked king who came in the spirit of the Antichrist, where Daniel falls on his face before the angel, he could not speak or lift himself up, and he, he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and before the throne of God, whereas this, this monstrous king, he rather magnified himself. And, and brethren, uh, we must also, mustn't we, walk humbly before our God, remembering how great he is, that he has times, all times, in the palm of his hand, and he cares for us. But let's give him the reverence and the adoration that he is worthy of. All glory to his name. God bless you.